Hi, and welcome to episode 34 of the Clax Women for Indie podcast. This week, as usual, we're going to drop into the Clax Wifey virtual coffee shop. Quite a short visit this week because we were struggling with our internet connection, so quite a lot of the discussion isn't really usable. To make up for that, I've also got a special treat for you at the end, which I'll come to later. Music this week, uh, yet more copyright-free, royalty-free music from YouTube. This one from Dynamics Recordings, and it's called The Last Battle. But first, you know the Clax Wifey's like asking questions. Well, this week we had a question for Dr. Craig DL when he was on the Indie Live Radio Daytime Live show. Here's what happened. I've got a question here for you, Craig, from yeah. the public chat room, and it's from um, Fiona from uh, Clack Manager Women for Independence. Her question is, has Craig covered how to recoup UBI from tax? If not, how does that work? I'm so daft I don't even understand that question. Right. <laughs> Yeah. See, when so, I hear the word tax, my brain immediately um, <laughs> freezes up. So please, um, I, like, I would love to hear your answer to that, Craig. That's probably <laughs> a sensible and rational response to hearing tax. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure. So, so yes, my 2017 paper did model um, the, the, the tax implications. We okay. uh, came up with what we called a revenue neutral model. So um, we worked out how much the the UBI would cost. Uh, we then subtracted off the cost of the benefits that we'd be replacing, uh, and then we came up with this this sum. I think I can't remember the number off the top of my head. I think it was about eight billion pounds a year for Scotland that it would need to find uh, in addition to to make that revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also created a a change to the income tax scales. To, to raise that amount. Uh, it's, a, it's work that has been done in other schemes as well. So there was a, a, a UBI created by Bath University in 2016, 2017 that, that did a similar thing. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of other groups that have used similar kinds of modelling. Um, that one came out to uh, having the top rate of tax somewhere in the low 50s. I think it was about 53%. It wasn't a huge change uh, what it actually meant was if you were on a salary of about £33,000 or less, you would end up better off with the UBI scheme that, that we created. If you were on more than that, then you would end up slightly slight, paying slightly more. Mm -hmm. um, why would you vote for something like that if you were paying a little bit more? Well, if you wanted to see the societal benefits, great. But also, one of the big benefits for a UBI if you're on a high wage is still that security of income. I know people who, you know, have been on a fairly high but irregular wage, again, freelancers, things like that. Um, I know people who have wanted to set up a business. I've been in this position myself where we've had an idea for a business, thought, right, this could be something that we want to pursue. But if I do this, I have no income until the, the business is profitable. And if the business fails, you know, I, I literally could not afford for that business to fail, so I'd ended up not pursuing that idea. There will be others in that position. If a universal basic income had been around, maybe giving that security of income to take a risk like that, maybe we'd see a lot more businesses created. That's really interesting because um, it, it, to me, when I hear universal basic income, it always 
seems to me that you know it, it, it's to do with social justice and supporting the vulnerable but that's a that's an, a different angle mm. that's an idea of it supporting entrepreneurship and creativity that that's that's really interesting i hadn't thought of that angle this is why i like to call it social security mm-hmm. that security aspect is is yeah. very important um, can I just uh, add a little postscript from Fiona, who asked that question? She would also like to thank you for retweeting the Clack's Wifey's podcast. <laughs> so to <today>, say <laughs> thank you to you. <laughs> could, could... It's a really good podcast. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's brilliant. It really what? is. One interesting thing about this lockdown is we've all had a lot more time to, to, to listen to podcasts. We've also had a lot more time to, to create podcasts. So, That's so, true. little shameless plug for the Commonwealth Policy <laughs> Podcast if, if you want to Absolutely. check that one out too. <laughs> Thanks for that, Craig. And there's nothing at all shameless about promoting each other's podcasts. I think it's great for the indie movement to be supporting each other like this. You might have noticed over the last few podcasts, Clax Wifies are helping Indie Live Radio with their promotion and marketing, trying to get the independence message out to as wide an audience as we can. So one thing that anybody listening could do that would really help is if you haven't listened to Indie Live Radio, then give it a go. It's It's got some great programmes on it, including ours at 10am on a Tuesday and 6pm on Thursdays. But also a whole range of other great music shows, live show discussion, podcasts. We've got a new podcast on, on disability issues in relation to COVID-19, which is really interesting. We just had the first episode of that, so you can catch that on a Monday at 7pm, then repeated a couple of times through the week as well. So if you want to know what's on the schedule for Indie Live Radio, if you have a look on the website and just go on the tab mark schedule and it tells you what's on every day of the week. There's also a Facebook page. They've also got Twitter. We've also just started experimenting with creating a YouTube channel for the radio. So content from the radio that would go on our podcast channel at podbean.com. We're also going to put on YouTube and see if that manages to attract a different segment of people because this is really about getting independence messages out there and engaging with the Yes Movement and being a resource for the Yes Movement to use. One of the things that would be great if we could have maybe a little more interaction with with Yes groups but at the moment of course the lockdown is curtailing everybody's activities but there's anything we can do if you want to have a chat, if you want to have an online chat, if you want to promote what you're doing, anything like that, get in touch via Facebook, Twitter, or you can text direct to the show at 07507 248856. And we'll see what we can do for you. Now, time to get the kettle on and join us in the virtual coffee shop. I hated history at school. My history teacher was dire. We we were at Graham High School in Falkirk. We had part of the Antonine Wall opposite us, you know, in the grounds opposite. We never left the school. It was so boring. Yeah, Neil loved history because his history teacher was an ex-pilot from one of the wars and brought the whole thing to life for them. So I had, I had a similar thing. I mean, we had, um, I mean, Office Dyke was along the road for us. Literally, you know, Mum, I think, Chepstow, it was right there. That wasn't part of the curriculum. And how's your week been, Tracy? Hi. Same as every other week, I think, at the moment. <laughs> oh, wow. So, Lenny, you were talking about the fact that your school was right opposite history and you never left. I went to Bannockburn High School and never did the Battle of Bannockburn. I went to the girls' school in Monmouth. We never had a trip to the Nelson Museum, which was in the middle of Monmouth. We never went to Monmouth Castle. But 
I thought that was bad enough, but if you're saying you went to Banner in high school, uh, yeah. you went to Banner Burn, that's... And I went to Morstone yeah. Primary, and you can see the Battle of Banner Burn, the visitor centre, from the playground, because it's Borstone as in the, the flagstone, it's in the Borstone. Never did it there either. How do you keep your history down, though, when it's, like, right in front of your face? Or maybe we should write a poem about all the, the history that's in our faces that we were never taught because it wasn't part of our curriculum. Oh, it happens good. everywhere, though, doesn't it? This is it. You know, you don't you don't learn about what is right by you. The only time I did do that was when I originally came from Enfield. <coughs> well, before that, I was right in the centre of London but because um, I was at Fulham. But then we moved out to Enfield, and Enfield had 40 Hall there. But 40 Hall was where... Uh, so Walter Riley was supposed to have laid his cloak down for the Queen. Mm. We did learn that, and we were also near Hatfield House, and we did learn about that. But, uh, you know, other than that, there was a lot of things could have been done and weren't done, you know. We got the Tudors. Got the Industrial Tudors. Revolution, crop rotation. I remember crop rotation, yeah. Like that, so it's interesting we've all had that experience. Language as well is another divider. And I think it was last week's Leslie Riddick podcast with Paddy Joyce who she partners with the pair of them converse he's from Dundee and he did this little bit in Scots from Dundonian and it was remarkable this whole sort of speech that he did and Alistair Heather the guy who's the Scots speaker who's featured in the documentary they those two are getting together to do some kind of Scots language thing of course I immediately think of you Tracy and think oh you know how, how cool would that be if we had some kind of Scots language but I did discussion. that at school I did Scots at school do a lot of drama and, and everything was in Scots and then for higher English we did Sunset Song which is in Doric mm. And I always remember the English teacher at the time saying, there's a dictionary at the back of all the words that they've made up. And the whole class going, but these are words that we use. Have we made them up? And getting really confused about that. What do you say? It's a different language. I, well, I have a friend up in Inverness who said, wow, well, a waste of money them putting all the road signs in a Gaelic. Who even speaks that anymore? And I'm going, mm. well, you know, it's our native language that was basically, you had your tongue cut out if you tried to speak it. That was how it, what, you know, part of the, the method of oppression. The rubbish Scots and, and cancelled out Gaelic. Gaelic place names are really interesting though because you can kind of, they're so descriptive. It's a picture of the place rather than just a name, isn't it? I think they're fascinating. I've got a day off, enjoying myself, I've got a couple of day off, I think we've got a couple of week trip, maybe to be in Q later on. Something. You'd be playing croquet at all? <laughs> Absolutely, I'm going to go and cut that and then lay out the croquet lawn. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Did she mention bool at all? I quite like a game of bool, but I don't know if we're allowed. Oh, or, or maybe petonk, maybe? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about polo? My pony needs a bit of an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, take him to the beach. It could be water polo. <laughs> well, that might get rid of a few folk on the beach. I know. What was that like? That, those scenes at Portobello? Shocking. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? it is. It's absolutely madness. crazy. When you're looking at Brighton Beach, you think you can think, "Oh, you morons!" Of course, look what you're doing when you've got mixed messages coming from your prime minister. But then, if we're doing the same thing, it kind of removes that moral high ground a bit, doesn't it? But you get people up here who are not not listening to Nicola, mm, they're just listening to Boris and assuming that that applies to them. Yeah. I've had people say that, and I, I said, "Well, what makes you think that?" Well, because they said it on the on the, the bulletin. That I, I said, "Which bulletin?" Well, the one at five o'clock. I went, "No." That one doesn't apply to us. Mm. Yeah. Three, I said that the important one to listen to is half past 12 and listen to Nicola Sturgeon because that's what's happening in Scotland. You live in Scotland. And I think some people, as a matter of principle, won't listen to the Scottish message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they just it, no. it, it just falls on deaf ears. No, I've got a friend who lives down in Dunstable and she actually hates Nicola Sturgeon. All right, she's nothing to do, you know, she's English and she lives down there. And when she heard I was for Nicola Surgeon, an SMP, she really started having a go at me. 
And then, you know, we've, we've agreed to differ on it. You know, it's the, the easiest way. It's a friendship. It's a long-term friendship, and we've agreed to differ. But the other day, I couldn't believe it. She actually, I posted something, and she came back, and she said, on this occasion, I have to agree with you. Nicola's got it right. And I went, wow. <laughs> She said, no, seriously, she has got it right. And I thought that was so nice that she had the guts to admit yeah. it, you know. It's the hardest thing for people, isn't it? It's admitting yeah. that they're... Did, you, did anybody watch Nicola on Lorraine Kelly this morning? The was... Um, oh, we've had Ruth Davidson on this morning, who has... I can't remember what it was Ruth Davidson had said about uh, being, like, sort of, like, out of kilter with the rest of the UK type of thing. And and Nicola started went, well, I think that's just a stupid thing to say. Um, <laughs> she says, <laughs> you know, but I mean, she was very, very, very reasonable. And you could tell she was maybe mildly annoyed, but she's saying, I am not doing this from a political stance. I am doing this to keep everybody safe, to make sure we do as much as possible to save lives. And everything, and she does, She, we all know that. She answers questions really well. She doesn't criticise, she's never criticised mm. Boris. When the rest of us are screaming, call him out for what he is, she has never criticised him. And she, she said, as always, she spoke really well, and she said, she was asked about the care homes and should things have been done differently. And she said, we made decisions on the information we had at the time. This, the knowledge we're getting is evolving as we go along. She said it's easy with hindsight for anybody to go back and say, yes, I would have made a different decision. But we made the decisions, the best decisions at the time on the information we had because we were still learning about it. So at the end of it, Lorraine Kelly, and she had, I don't know who's a, is it Hillary? Is it the doctor that's on, Dr. Hillary? And they said, oh, Oh, she's, it's nice to see a politician that's really human, you know, she's, and he went, yes, he said, I have found nothing contentious in anything she has ever said. And then Lorraine Kelly finished up with, yeah, yeah, she, she's very human, just like Ruth Davidson was. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got to ruin it. <laughs> Interesting, the other day when they did Prime Minister's Question Time, and you'd already heard beforehand that they were going to try and bolster the number of Tories in there to give them a bit more support, because they said when Keir Starmer was put in questions, he's very much about the detail, whereas Boris is very much big picture, bluff and bluster, um, and he, he felt he was clearly uncomfortable and felt uncomfortable being asked these detailed kind of questions and uh, so why do they call it like prime minister questions when half the time it's not questions it's just a tory making a statement does the right honorable gentleman agree with me well that's not a question that's mm. just a statement one of my friends had said i had this discussion about clapping for the nhs and how nhs workers are like any bother clapping for us we're doing our jobs what we want to be able to do is to do our job properly make sure use your vote correctly so that it's going to be a party that are going to support the nhs quite sort of um disingenuous turning up and clapping for us on a thursday night if you vote for tories type of thing so we were having this discussion and i had said we go out and clap every thursday because i've got at least four neighbors that i know of that are nurses and it's out there to show kind of thanks for them I said but I said my neighbours are in no doubt of which way I vote by the flags and the <laughs> slates and the things that are stuck up on the front of my door this is something I didn't understand properly at all I mean the, the Scottish Greens have wanted to have a platform on it might be two or three things but I think that the, the ones that stand out are the anti-tax breaks for people using tax havens mm -hmm. and the other one being uh, rent breaks um, for tenants which on paper sounds like it sorts out the landlords as well. So th the question being then why why it was opposed when it was brought to Holyrood. So I think there's the nitty gritty behind that about what was in that bill that meant that working out what was their objection to either the bill in that form or actually the four principles behind that bill. Yeah, because another thing I read about was they said, well, they hadn't had enough notice to read his amendment and then Andy Whiteman produced evidence that he'd actually sent them this over a week before it was brought into 
to Holyrood. So, you know, so whilst everyone's focusing on the pandemic, there's still all this kind of nitty gritty and political point scoring stuff that's, that's going on in the background as well. No, I was just going to say the number of people that I that have spoken and said, you know, this isn't a time for for there to be political parties. This is a time where everyone should be pulling together and getting it right for everyone, regardless of your polit- political viewpoint. The, the focus should be public health, and that's it. As simple as that. <laughs> For our final section this week, we're going to focus on Alistair Jack. Who, you might be thinking? Well, Alistair Jack is the guy who holds the completely redundant and unnecessary office of Secretary of State for Scotland. Now, this might sound as if it's an office that exists for our benefit. No, this is Westminster's man in Scotland. So essentially the Secretary for State against Scotland, if you like, the colonial overlord. Alistair Jack replaced David Mundell. And you wouldn't think that was a terribly high bar set, really. But Alistair Jack is getting nowhere near it. (laughs) Alistair Jack is digging holes underneath the bar, so he's even further below it. He's been in the papers recently for a couple of things. The first, I'm going to play you actually a clip from the Scottish Affairs Committee on the 14th of May. Now, this is Pete Wishart asking Alistair Jack some questions about the UK government's revised guidance on COVID. Now, we'll just have a little listen to this and see if that clears up any misunderstandings there might be about his position. Well, uh, could you tell us just a little bit more then about what the stay alert actually means? And we'll forego the, the experience of the Welsh Welsh golf course. I mean, I went out for a walk yesterday. I'm, I'm usually quite an alert person, and I'm pretty certain I was staying alert. Is there anything in particular I should have done? And when the Prime Minister was asked what this meant, he said it's about exercising good old British common sense. Well, what's... What what does that mean? And are there people in Scotland whose common sense is more British than others? Well, luckily, the British public are showing from from the government um, data we have now over the last week and the uh, focus groups, the British public are showing that they do have a lot of common sense because they completely understand what it means. It means exactly what the First Minister has been saying for the last few days, which is remain vigilant. Stay alert, remain vigilant. Exactly the same message. You should... Go to you only go to work, and this is the this is an English message, not a Scottish message. I'm giving you now. You should only go to work if you can't work from home. You should a- apply all social distancing when you're at work. You should be working in a COVID safe environment. Obviously, you should continue to wash your hands and do all the other sensible things that we've suggested. But you should stay alert to the risks. It's as simple as that. Lastly, for me. Um... Do you not agree, the Secretary, that the, the government has made a pig's ear out of this new messaging? And looking at the scenes yesterday from London where we saw packed trains and packed buses, isn't this new messaging just putting at risk all the good work that the stay-at-home message has achieved? Well, we deeply hope it isn't. We've asked today Sadiq Khan to put on many more tubes. I mean, the, 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 uh, we need a... We, need a lot more trains running to deal with that problem and we're tackling that uh, issue today and but I again I hope we don't see a spike we have to at some point make some baby steps but I would make one point here and it's a point that Scottish government ministers have made as well although there's been a lot of a, a lot of noise in the media about this the differences between the UK government and the Scottish government are absolutely minuscule. And that's an important point to me. And that point has been made not just by me, but also by John Swinney. And we, we, we want to pull out of this together. We want to work together. We want to cooperate together. And I believe we will. And I believe that we will defeat this virus as, as one United Kingdom. And lastly, you said that you will be in your place for Scotland office questions on Wednesday. What's your advice to 
the rest of us Scottish members of Parliament about travelling to London to be at that session. We understand that the UK government is going to end all the virtual proceedings next week with the expectation we should all just therefore then turn up to Parliament as there will be no more remote voting. So if we're going to exercise our democratic right, we will have to turn up. Surely, as a Secretary for Scotland, you must have some particular view about this. And what risk do you think this presents to us and our staff? Well, I don't think it is next week that it's going to end, but 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 I may I'll be corrected on that if it's the case. But what I, I, I Chairman, I do agree with you. I don't think Scottish uh, or the nuance of what you're saying. I don't think Scottish members of Parliament should be going to Westminster next week. The Speaker wants to have ministers at the dispatch box. He can't conduct questions without a minister in the chamber for fear of you know failure in the virtual proceedings. But it's, it's certainly the case that when, when Parliament do, does go back, it won't be 650 members crammed in together. It will be the 50 members only uh, sitting in Parliament, social distancing being observed. I can't speak to the timing of that. That's a matter for the Speaker and, and others, the House authorities and the leader. But um, as to next week, I, I'm going to London because it's my duty. I, as you acknowledged on the radio this morning, you know, as an MP, we're all key workers. So I, I, if I have to travel, I will travel. But I would rather like you to be staying in, as you say, Bonnie Perthshire. I'd rather be in Bonnie Galloway for the, for the whole experience. And that's not possible because I have to be at the dispatch box. So that clears everything up nicely then, doesn't it? So two things clear to me, apart from the fact that Alistair Jack is a terrible speaker, he clearly has no idea what the UK government's advice means any more than any of the rest of us do and also he's quite happy to endanger the lives of his family constituents and anybody else he meets on his way by doing a 700 mile round trip to London despite the fact there being perfectly acceptable alternatives clearly to him being there because they've been doing it remotely for the last what three weeks so clearly it is possible there's no need for him to be in London but for all his many faults and failings, Alistair Jack has actually done something wonderful this week. He has inspired a piece of performance art. Now, how this unlikely event came about. A couple of weeks ago, Alistair Jack was writing in The Scotsman, pronouncing that regardless of any other considerations, Scotland must remain in lockstep with the rest of the UK with regard to coming out of lockdown. This, of course, got the endorsement of Michael Gove and Jacob Rees-Mogg. But Pete Wishart, again, urged the Tories to consider the best interests of the people of Scotland. And the SNP deputy leader, Keith Brown, in tweeting, if I understand your argument, if advice in Scotland is that the R number is too high and risk of further deaths from a second wave is too high, then the rest of the UK should stay in lockstep with Scotland, regardless of any other advice to the UK government. There was also a comment, stupid article, full stop. But if UK government wants to play politics, they're also doing it very, very badly. Uh, three quarters of Scots approve of the ScotGov's handling of the crisis and seven out of ten Scots have confidence in Nicola Sturgeon. And then finally, political journalist Paul Hutchin had said what Alistair Jack really saying is devolution should be put in furlough. And that is exactly what he's saying, I think. So that's the background. But what happened on Facebook? Uh, Facebook ever succinct. Somebody on Facebook had posted... The headline, Alistair Jack says Scotland must stay in lockstep with UK over exit strategy, followed by a verse from Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. And that verse was, forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the Valley of Death rode the 600. Many of you will know, uh, we also do a poetry show on Indie Live Radio. It goes out on a Sunday at one o'clock and repeated at nine o'clock and then again at nine o'clock on a Friday. It gave us the idea, why don't we do that poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, and just remind ourselves that just because somebody is in a position of leadership doesn't mean they are competent to be in that position, doesn't mean they're 
going to make the right decisions doesn't mean they could care less about the people affected by their decisions so that's what we did and so we're going to play it for you now this is part of Sunday's poetry show by Sven who is a good friend to the Clax Women for Indy so thanks for listening and we'll catch you all next week here's the charge of the light brigade the charge of the light brigade by Alfred Tennyson Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death throw the 600. Forward the light brigade. Charge for the guns! Into the valley of death throw the 600. Forward the light brigade! Was their man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to right of them. Cannon to left of them. Cannon the front of them. Volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death. Into the mouth of hell rode the 600. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, Cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade. Noble 600. And in life.